Okay, thank you all for coming to Weasel Your Way to the Top, How to Handle a Technical Interview. Um, this is not the first time I've given this talk, and the jokes don't tend to get any better from session to session, but the content improves ever so slightly. So, the big question we're starting off with, come in, come in, is who am I and why am I qualified to give this talk? Great question. Glad you asked. Uh, until Friday, I was a consultant at a company called Taos, uh, where I have been for two years. Uh, starting Monday, I'm moving into management at a company called Originate, but for this weekend, I'm unemployed, which makes me the ideal person to give interview advice. Uh, for the past two years, though, as a consultant, what I've done has been twofold. First, I've changed assignments every two to three months, so I'm constantly going through a series of client interviews. Given the fact that I wear a suit, for some reason a lot of these clients are not willing to take I know technology on faith, so they like to grill me up one side and down the other. Uh, on the other side of the coin, I was part of the interview team at Taos. I've interviewed 100 people over two years looking for various consultants uh, to have different skill sets to come aboard. So I'm always practicing. Something that I noticed about interviewing early on was that it's a skill like anything else. And most people tend to wind up in an environment where their only interview practice comes when they are unemployed or looking to leave and change jobs. They get the job offer, they sign on the dotted line, and whoo, glad that's over. I don't have to do this again for another three and a half years. Well, at that point, you're, you're sliding back down the curve back to square one. And as a consultant, you do this on a constant, ongoing basis. You're always refreshing your skill set in this. So it's something I had practice at and it seemed to lend itself naturally to interviewing. So let's start by talking about your resume. This is the only slide in the entire slide deck that is even going to mention your resume, and the reason being is that your resume doesn't matter if you're doing this properly. Uh, it sh it's a formality, or at least it should be a formality. When you wind up deciding you want to go work to some, at some company and you fire off your resume into jobs at or hit the apply button on a website, at, uh, on DICE or whatnot, that's effectively going through it from a chump's perspective. Something like 70% of jobs that are filled are never advertised publicly, which means that you are competing with every other resume off of the internet to compete for those 30% of jobs that are. I tend to prefer a different approach to this, and I like to call it the way of the weasel. Um, it essentially distills down to backdoor introductions. Uh, let's say that as I was walking through the exhibit hall earlier today, I'd taken a sudden sharp blow to the back of the head. And when I regained consciousness, I wanted to work at Microsoft. Now, <laughs> the naive approach is to fire off an email to jobs at Microsoft.com and hope for the best. The way that I would approach that in a more rational way would be to reach out through LinkedIn, through Twitter, through people I know personally, and figure out who do I know that works at Microsoft? Or take it out a level if the answer is no one. Who do I know that knows someone who works at Microsoft? From there, my plan is to reach out, start a conversation with that person, take them to lunch. I'm not asking for a job. I'm asking them questions. Tell me what it's like to work for the great Satan. What's it like to wind up going into a, going into a company like this every day? What sort of people do you look for? What, what are the opportunities? What are the challenges? Ideally, by the end of that conversation, you have a rough idea that, okay, this is someplace I could be comfortable working. At that point, you're perfectly positioned to ask them to drop your resume in front of the hiring manager or perform an introduction. Most companies offer significant bonuses if you wind up referring a qualified candidate. And if you refer someone who's terrible and doesn't get the job offer, it doesn't reflect on you. That's something a lot of people still struggle with, is the idea of, well, what if I refer someone who's crap? Uh, the answer to that is there's a world of difference between a referral and a recommendation. Just make very clear which is which. Um, as we actually go through the interview process itself, I'm going to start by giving you some of the same tired advice that you're going to find anytime you Google how to handle an interview. The reason I have to give this is that this talk started out as what do I wish the people I'm interviewing knew about job interviews before they got to me? And this, is what the, and this is what I've taken away from this. Um, if I get to the point in an interview where I ask if you have any questions for me and your answer is, nope, I'm good, uh, it shows that you're either a simpleton or you're not particularly interested in the job or the company. It helps to show passion 
It helps to express an interest in the company you're speaking to, just expressing an interest in what this person you're talking to does with their day. It also helps to educate yourself about the company that you're speaking to. Uh, Wikipedia is a decent source for this. Glassdoor can be a good source for this. Look at people who've worked there in the past if they're large enough, who've posted blogs about work culture, and figure out a bit more about this company other than what their name is. Look on their website. Figure out how they talk about themselves. Mission statements don't have a lot of practical application in the real world, but it's a great way of framing what the company views itself as and how they approach the world. There's some other challenges, though. Uh, it helps to remember what company you're interviewing at. Um, so why are you here? I always wanted to work at Google. OK, so we're your second choice here at Microsoft. Good to know. <laughs> like Microsoft is that high on anyone's list. Hey. And for God's sake, please use your brain. If you're not sure what someone does, feel free to ask. Uh, there was one interview I was in where the candidate asked the woman from HR uh, how long she'd been doing this and how long she'd been in the HR department. And her response was, well, given that I'm the CEO, I guess I've been in HR about eh, on and off 20 seconds now. Uh, that didn't go well. It, if you're not sure the role that someone plays in a company, ask. It's easy. Sometimes you can get this in advance, but if you forget, ask and don't make assumptions. It really doesn't go well to you. Trying to guess someone's profession by what they look like really doesn't help you. It also helps that people are going to ask you a bunch of questions that you should have something approaching a rehearsed answer for. The notorious example is, where do you see yourself in five years? And if you have an answer ready to go off the cuff, that's terrific, but hold back. Stop and think about it for a second. Huh, where do I see myself in five years? No one's ever asked me that before. I guess, and then you can lead into an answer, even if it is prepared. This works on a lot of questions. I would not recommend it for every question. Huh, that's a good question. What is my name? <laughs> there, there are some that it's sort of assumed that you should be ready to go. And it's important that you do prepare some answers for questions you're likely to get. Uh, otherwise, you come back and you're way too honest. <laughs> I'm going to come back to that point in a few minutes when I talk about terrible interview questions. So is anyone else bored yet? Because frankly, I'm getting a little there myself. So let's get serious and talk about what we're actually here to discuss. This boils down to one simple key point that you should all be aware of, and that is that I'm awesome. Look, this talks about, thank, thank you, there we go, there, what a match, thank you. That's why we're here. No, I'm serious though. I'm well spoken, I believe it or not, do know how to use technology, and if you haven't noticed yet, especially people watching this in the future, I wear a suit. And I don't have a self-confident shortage anyway, probably just the opposite in fact. Uh, this talk is about selling yourself. I'm not here for my ego. But it's imperative that I believe in the product that I'm selling. In the context of an interview, that's me. And that applies to you, too. Now, maybe no one else in this room is wearing a suit, although you should because suits are awesome. I forgive you. But there are awesome things about you. And your job when you're going for an interview is to let that, those awesome things shine through. And this is not a time for modesty. Um, for example, some question I'd like to ask, uh, could you raise your hand, please, if you've, ever, if you've never in your life gone to a job interview and not received a job offer? Has anyone not ever, uh, never failed an interview? Yep, there's a few people in the hands of the room going up. Great. Congratulations. Interview more. There's no merit badge for, I've never gotten onto an interview where I didn't get the offer. Go out more. Aim higher. If you're if you continue, if you're always fail, uh, scared to wind up going for roles that you might not get, you're going to keep going for safe roles, and I generally tend to find that kind of boring. Uh, incidentally, when it comes to, on the topic of modesty here, this is often societal or cultural. Um, a lot of people, and I personally am born without the part of my brain that does this, but most people don't love going on about how wonderful they are. They find this embarrassing, they find it uh, cocky, and it's our nature to be self-effacing. The trick is, that's fine, and it probably makes you a better person than I am, but this is, an interview is not the time for modesty. So let's talk about, when I'm on the other side of the interview table, what I want from you. And 
I'm going to ask you a lot of questions through the course of the interview, but I really only care about three questions, and we're going to get to them in order. Can you do the job? Will you like the job? And can we stand working with you? So let's break those down. When we talk about doing the job, this is where we dig into the idea of technical questions. Uh, I might be awesome and ask open-ended questions if I'm interviewing for a systems administrator. I might say, all right, you, you log into a box, and maybe it's Unix, maybe it's Linux, it's Unix-like. How do you figure out what operating system you're on? There's only one correct answer to this question that works on everything, and to be honest, I don't care if they get it or not. If they do, and they say, oh, I'll use the uname command, great. Someone has removed the uname binary. So now instead of one right answer, there's 600 different directions you can go in, and they're all valid. But it's open-ended, and it lets me see how people think. Uh, sometimes you wind up at the other end of the spectrum, where people ask terrible questions. Which flag to DF is going to tell me what your, how many inodes uh, you have free? The answer to that is obviously read the man page, because I'm not particularly interested in detailed trivia that I may not use very often. If people know that it's dash I or not, it doesn't matter. It's, that doesn't help. But every person, interviewer has a different style. This also doesn't come down just to the hard technical questions. There's also social aspects, but we're going to get to that in a moment. The problem with liking the job is that hiring people is inherently expensive, as is firing people. It's important to figure out then whether someone is likely to be happy and thrive in the role. And there are a lot of ways you can do that. Passion, this is the dark, the dark side of the passion question. If you're deeply passionate about a number of different technologies and we don't use any of them, are you really likely to be happy in that role longer term? Are you, are you going to say, this is ridiculous, I quit? Um, another example is on call. Uh, personally, I'm getting old to the point where I don't want to be woken up at 2 in the morning by a pager because some server is running out of disk space. Um, and for some companies, that's fine. They, they outsource that to a knock who can handle low-level questions and they'll only escalate in the case of true catastrophe. A lot of companies still do on call manually, and that's fine. But I can tell as the interview candidate that that's probably not a great role for me. Uh, what's the type of work? Is it going to be the sort of, uh, sort of tickets, break, fix, and I'm not working on projects a lot? For some people, that's great. For others, they're going to be bored doing that. Uh, what about the way the company works? Uh, we have an open plan office, and everyone sits elbow to elbow at these giant slave galley tables, like everyone loves to do these days. For some people, that's great. Other people can't focus or concentrate in those environments. And that's going to wind up tying in greatly to will they be happy doing the job? And Depending on what, sta what uh, your position is, you may want to answer these questions differently. Um, in, on a slightly more serious note, if I have just been let go from my previous employer and it's been a few months and I have bills to worry about, I'm likely to start, I'm likely to start looking at jobs that may not be the ones I would like as much. Because being able to have a job you like is to some extent a luxury that ranks somewhere on the priority scale a bit, higher than, a bit lower than can I feed myself this month. Once you want, if you're in a job and you're looking for something else to make a transition, a lot of times it makes sense for you to wind up going and being very picky about what you want. Oh, you guys have an open plan office. Screw it. I'm out. I wouldn't recommend phrasing it that way, but you're welcome to do what you want. The last uh, of the three questions is... Can we stand working with you? Are you a tolerable person to work with? Um, this takes forms that are both really overt and really subtle. Uh, on the easy side, don't be racist. <laughs> you would think that this is a contrived example. It's not. I interviewed someone. This is on the record of the worst interview I've ever conducted. Uh, guy was doing fantastically well. He was nailing the questions. He was very senior in what he did, and I was preparing at that point to, yeah, let's bring this guy aboard. Right until he got so comfortable having this conversation with me about deep technical stuff that he just segued into a, oh, that reminds me of a funny story. How he got fired for sexism and racism at the same time from an airline in Texas. <laughs> I didn't realize you could be fired for bigotry in Texas. That's like a new high score. And what was astonishing wasn't just the fact that this happened, but that he somehow thought this was an appropriate story to tell during an interview. At that point, it doesn't matter how fantastic he is, he's going to make other people who work with him uncomfortable. And we're done. On the other side, 
it winds up getting into passion around technology again. Um, let's say in the configuration management space, uh, the puppet versus chef versus salt debate. Um, if you wind up deeply passionate about the wrong type of technology or even the right type of technology and you're very zealous for it, like, well, yes, this person agrees with all the technology selections we've made so far, but what if they don't? What if we make a decision that they don't agree with in the future? Are they going to accept it calmly or are they going to pitch a fit and storm out of the building? That's a concern. And what these questions all dance around is the idea of a culture fit. People want to work with people they are effectively capable of having a business conversation with. But no one's going to come right out and ask you flat out during the interview. So after they get through the technical question, so just answer this for me. Are you an asshole? You can tell that no one asked this question because I still managed to hold down a job myself. If people asked this question and I answered honestly, I would not be employed. Look at me. There's also the times where you're going to wind up in a technical interview where the interviewer sucks at asking technical questions and your job is to fix it. If someone asks you, so have you ever used the Apache web server? The wrong answer is no. The right answer is no, but I have done a lot of work with Nginx because it's 2015 and Apache hasn't really done a whole lot in the space I need it to these days. We're doing a lot more parallelized work and here's what I've done with it. It's you don't want to just answer the question as stated. You want to understand the real question they're asking. It's not, do you know how to quote from chapter and verse from the Apache configuration file? It's, we're using a web server here. Can you talk to me about your experience with web servers? Uh, this has a cultural element as well. A number of very gifted people don't want to correct the interviewer or overstep because they feel that that's rude. And it's important. You don't want to necessarily correct them outright, but you want to very subtly shift every answer you're giving back to your strengths. Uh, you want to be able to, you should have a list of things that you are excellent at, and by the end of an interview, even with them asking questions, you should have worked that list of things that you do better than almost everyone else into the conversation. Because if, they can't, if they're just asking things that they care about and they never get to the broader piece of it, well, we all look like lackluster candidates in that case. It comes down to controlling the conversation. And you can't necessarily do that by talking over an interviewer, but you can in the way you answer and the way you help adjust things. And the only way to get better at that is with practice. This is one that I tend to shine at. It, it helps to uh, not be modest when you're in an interview. And we talked about this a bit earlier. A common approach for people who are not quite as narcissistic as I am is to share credit. And that's noble, and again, you're a better person than I am for doing it. But don't do it in an interview. So what did you do? Oh, our team implemented Nagios. That's great, but what that sounds like in an interview is, well, some people in our company implemented Nagios, and I got to sit in the room while they did that. If you want to share credit, that's fine, but be very clear that when you do that, you're highlighting exactly what it is that you contributed to the, to the project and what your role was. Because as interesting as it is, what your company did on the macro level, the, inter the, the interview conversation is about you. It's not about your department, your team, or your group. Just make sure you highlight what you're doing. Now, this one continually tends to befuddle and surprise people. But just for the record, if we're in a technical interview and I ask you a technical question, I probably have a passing familiarity with what the right answer is. So if you don't, blatantly making things up probably isn't going to go well. The correct answer in, this, in, the, in an environment where you don't know the right answer is, I don't know. In fact, so many people are reluctant to use that three-word phrase that you'd be astonished. But the correct answer is, I don't know. But if I had to guess. And then, by all means, speculate wildly. If you get it right, fantastic, style points. If you don't, well, okay, that's fine, but you admitted it was a guess, you admitted where you don't know things, and you also showed the interviewer how you think, which is exactly what a job interview is trying to get at. And at this point, I want to just take a few minutes to go over some interview questions that I despise because they're terrible, but people keep asking them anyway. And 
it helps to really, really, really be prepared for them. Because if you don't, it's possible you're going to be entirely too honest when you answer. And I promise that nobody wants that. <laughs> so the first one you always see is, what's your greatest weakness? Well, some people tell me I'm condescending. That means I talk down to people. <laughs> yeah. This question is an invitation, open invitation to anyone to shoot yourself in the foot. Don't do it. Well, I got to say, sometimes at night when I go out with my coworkers, I party so hard that I show up to work the next morning still drunk. Yeah. Sometimes people will wind up phrasing this a bit differently. Uh, the one I've heard is, if I called your old boss to ask about you, what would she say? And the usual answer that people have given for this historically that is cliche and now no longer works is you dress up a weakness or a positive as a weakness. So your answer is, well, I'm too much of a perfectionist. People know that's coming at this point. So my approach to this, and feel free to steal this one, is to list a real weakness, but dress it up, but, but make sure that you explain why it's not going to be a problem. The one that I use, and you're welcome to steal this, is I work on so many different things that a lot of times I wind up forgetting what I've committed to get done to various people. So as a result, I carry a notebook and I keep a lot of lists. The end. What have I really admitted to in that? Well, I'm going to be carrying a notebook in a meeting from time to time. We can probably live with that. It also showed a self-awareness of this is something that I sort of suck at, but I'm going to take it forward with me and I've already recognized it and dealt with it. That shows growth. People will usually leave you alone after something like that. Feel free to steal that and make that this generation's cliched answer. And this is one of those fill in the blank questions you'll see. Uh, can you give me an example of a time you fill in the blank had to work with a difficult person, had to balance two competing priorities of equal weight, broke production, punched an obnoxious interviewer right in his stupid condescending face? <laughs> you should have some stories ready to go for this. And feel free to embellish in order to adjust an actual story to something a bit more in line with what they're asking. I promise they're not going to fact check you on this one. What they're usually looking for is had to balance competing priorities. People will go through backflips to answer the question, well, I have two things to do by the end of today. There's only eight hours. But if I skip lunch and I wind up dragging other people in to help work on this, I can deliver both. Wrong answer. The correct answer people are always looking for in that story is, I'm going to bring both people into a room together. I'm going to sit down with them, and I'm going to wind up negotiating delivery schedules with both of them. Alternately, escalate the, oh, escalate the issue to someone who's uh, over both of these people and let them do the traffic setting and prioritization. That is the entire reason management exists. Don't try to do their job for them. You should also have good examples of times you broke production. If you haven't broken production at all, you should probably come up with, a, with a, a good story of a time you pretend you broke production. The reason being is the right answer, counterintuitively, is not, I've never broken production. That tells me one of three things and none of them are good. The first is that you're lying. The second is that you are so slow moving and, slow cautious, and so cautious that it's unlikely that you're ever going to be um, able to iterate rapidly. And the third is that nobody trusts you around anything even marginally important. None of those present well. So you want to have a good story ready to go. Uh, times working with difficult coworkers, same approach. Come up with a story, but always be, present yourself as sympathetic, as willing to work with people by, by understanding what other people's actual motivations and needs are. The moral of the story should not distill down to, so yeah, the DBA was a jerk. Now, it's probably true because if you met DBAs, but you don't need to call that out in the interview. Anyone who has any work experience will probably understand this. And if you're an actual DBA, I do apologize, but you have some problems. You people. <laughs> this is one that I particularly loathe. It, because it comes down to where they wind up, they're usually proud of something they have done in their career. Uh, a real life example. I, uh, 
this was at a place I worked for a year, and this interview question should have told me everything I needed to know about this place up front, but I wasn't paying attention. They describe their own home-built database system. Uh, yeah, no, this was not a database company, just for, just for, for clear there. This, so that starts the poor decision chain. And they were seeing slow queries on some, on some indexed uh, uh, values, but not others, uh, depending on when it had been added to the database. It was a relatively in-depth question, but it is still down to my answer was, all right, so let's run this through S-Trace and see what the system calls are and why that would work. And the response was, what's S-Trace? So, okay, that's fair. Not everyone knows every tool. I explained that it watches system calls. It can give timing information on them. It's like, oh, yeah, that would totally have solved the problem. Great. Okay, pretend S-Trace doesn't exist. What would you do now? And, it, okay, so if you just take tools away when it doesn't follow the narrow path this person set out, what they're doing in those scenarios is they're, they want to see if you'll solve the problem the exact same way that they did, even if their way was stupid. So... The trick is you just keep going and keep guessing and feeling around. And when they reveal their answer that they're very proud of, say, wow, that's a really interesting approach. It's honest and sounds really positive. And then hope they'll move on. Usually this is just, I did something technical once upon a time and I'm still proud of it. Uh, another one is asking why you want to work here. And this is where you have to feign some enthusiasm for some companies, depending upon your current state of your job hunt. I'm deeply passionate about the business potential your Twitter for Pets clone represents. So it, this is the kind of place we're going to move the industry and change the world. It helps to show some enthusiasm for what they do. Asking them again, so what is it you even do here exactly? Is, is, this is the wrong part of the conversation to have that, uh, that particular tangent. It's important you should at least have a reason to go of why you want to work at the company you're speaking to. You'd think this would be obvious, but while you're explaining why you want to go work there, make sure you don't crap all over your previous employer. Uh, so, oh, the reason I'm looking to leave? Yeah, differences with my freaking boss. That says a lot. None of it good. Uh, the reason you left, and remember this, take it with you, is growth. You always leave companies for growth opportunities. You're going to see, have an access to strategy in a way you didn't before. You were really good at their old environment, but you wanted to work with a different technology stack. You wanted to work as part of a larger team, part of a smaller team, part of a different team, part of no team. Whatever it is that differentiates the new employer that they're proud of, it, tie that in. But you never, ever say anything even slightly negative about a previous employer that is considered to be a giant red flag. The time to tell the stories about your previous employer are either therapy hour or once you're already employed and you're having a hangout session with your new coworkers because your new job is not on the line in those conversations. Another great answer not to give is, oh, why do I want to work here? Because I'm broke. <laughs> Speaking of... If you're having a discussion about what the salary looks like in an interview, punt. It's too early. The, you want the discuss salary discussion and numbers discussion to come in at the end of the interview process when they're about to make you an offer. Because any time before that, you're going to get it wrong. The first person who names a number is going to lose. And the reason being is you want to sell them on you as a person not the number up front. You can also always go lower than your first number. You can almost never go higher. And one thing they love to ask that I would strongly advise avoiding is what is, well, what are you making right now? What's your salary history? I find that to be a rude question, but I've come to accept that the company, in most cases, it's, we've accepted this in corporate America, that's the company's one free pass at screwing you. And it's generally polite to just smile, nod, and let it go by. Oh, I don't usually disclose that. And they say, well, I, and then there's a whole dance that starts up. And as far, as far as how far you can hold out before giving them a number, this is going to depend on one key question. And it requires a bit of self-reflection. In the job market and the job that you're looking to get, are you talent or are you a commodity? For the first five or ten years of most people's careers, you are going to consider yourself a commodity. The reason being is we're hiring five of you. We just need someone else to come in and fill the seat and fill the role. 
toward once you start getting more mid-level to senior at that point it's talent it's yeah we find a lot of people in this sector with experience but you've done x y and z that we're trying to achieve here and that means we're not looking for a person we are looking for you you have a lot more leverage in the second case than you do in the first when you are new to the career when you're new, new to the industry and new to your career you've got to be able to effectively sell yourself and you may wind up having to give a number it's there's there's not a perfect science unfortunately i just strive to avoid it wherever possible you will the first few times you try this make some mistakes and that's okay incidentally like the funny comic says if when well, the numbers you're getting and the numbers you think you're worth are not matching up assume that you're wrong personally i think that the value i bring to a company is about six bucks an hour uh, the market and apparently the labor law disagree but so in that scenario i shut up and i go with the market now in order to do that it's imperative that i know what the market is to do that i like going to salary surveys i like looking at glassdoor.com and then i like aiming a bit higher than that um, one thing to consider as well if you're forced into giving a number about what you're currently making the phrase I like to use is my total compensation package is that includes salary any bonuses any retirement plan matching any equity you may have uh, any uh, benefits that may come along with this uh, so you can generally tend to take uh, a, add on about another 20 to 30 percent completely honestly sometimes they'll call you out on it sometimes they won't but it doesn't hurt again you can go pretty far down the weasel path on this stuff but past a certain point, it gets to be a little on the strange and screwy side. And when this happens, it's usually because the company has forgotten one very important lesson, namely that this is a two-way conversation. And companies forget this. I was at a conference, Scale, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, whenever it was. And there was a company that was very interested in bringing me aboard. So it was on a Saturday. I met with uh, one of the people I've been speaking with who's on the recruiting team and I asked him, so great, how are things? Where's everyone else? Oh, we're working on a production release so they're not able to go to the conference this year. Now, that's fair and it's honest and it is in no way, shape, or form representative of the kind of company I want to work for. When I'm not allowed to go to a conference I've been planning for because someone didn't schedule a release appropriately, that tells you a lot. And you, and you can remember this when you're hearing them describe what they're working on. When you hear them talk about what a hero they were, about the 14-hour day they had to work last week. They're telling you what work is like there. It makes sense to listen. I'm not saying it's going to make your decision for you, but it's useful to listen to stories about what these people ask. And remember as well that even if a company offers you a job, there is nothing that says you have to take it. In fact, I'm a big fan of suggesting as well as gathering market data. Make it a point over the next three months, that's a, that's a quarter, to go out and interview somewhere. I do that every quarter. I go out to practice interviews for companies I, at least initially, don't have a tremendous intention to go work for, but I want to practice my interview skills. People have asked me before, well, don't you find that a little bit unethical to interview for a job that you don't have any interest in taking? No, I don't. Because remember, the interviews are a two-way street. And the job that I uh, just left, Taos, was a practice interview. I figured I would talk to them and see what they were working on. And it turned out I really liked them. So for two years, I worked there because I did and continue to enjoy what they work on. I left again for growth, for a new opportunity. But the reason I went there in the first place was because they sold me on coming to work there. I also went for a bunch of interviews while I was at Taos and other companies that failed to convince me to come work there. Remember, all I'm offering you is the chance to sit down with me and convince me that I should work for you while my job is to convince you that you want to hire me. And those both have to be completed. So ultimately, it comes down to practice. It's not something that you wind up able to focus on, that you're able to get good at just by reading a book and then 18 months from now, go out and interview somewhere. You definitely want to be able to practice as much as possible. 
the last question anyone is going to ask you is in the interview is, do you have any questions for me? And the reason that this is the last question they will ask you is because your job is to keep lobbing questions at them until they shut you down. And a lot of times the question comes out of the blue and you haven't had the time to gather your thoughts yet. So the question that I like to answer with initially is, okay, there's a lot of technologists in the market or you've been, this job rack has been open for a little while and you've spoken to a number of people and you haven't filled the role yet. You meet a lot of candidates. What is it that you're not seeing that you're hoping to find to fill this role? And at this point, when you've effectively just asked them since it's the end of the interview and they've been thinking about you the entire time, is a very polite, very circumspect version of, so now that we've been speaking for an hour or two, what about me are you not quite convinced is a fit for the role? And when they give you the answer, you reiterate why you are a fit in the ways that they've just mentioned. Another fun question about uh, do you have any questions for me is, what's your favorite part about working here? And then they're going to go on with something prosaic. You can mostly tune out, look out the window, look at the squirrels frolicking. And as they run down, oh, the free lunches are delicious. And oh, they stopped beating us last year. It was great. <laughs> and once they wind down, then you refocus your attention. Like, oh, that's great. Now, not to put too much of a negative spin, but let's turn that around. What's your least favorite part about working here? And if you have multiple interviews and you ask the same question to multiple people, you'll start to see a pattern emerge. A lot of times they'll center around cultural challenges, such as lack of focus. We never know what we should be working on. Now, people are not usually likely to come out and tell you, man, this place sucks. Let me tell you about why. If so, they probably shouldn't be representing their company on an interview, but that's just my personal opinion on this. But start to build a picture. You want as much data as possible before a job offer comes and you have to make a decision. On a related note, I will never respond to a job offer the same day. Thank you. I will reach out, let them know I received it. Terrific. I'm going to review this with my family. I'm going to think about this and I will get back to you by the end of the week, a few days, next week if it's the end of the week. Um, remember, companies spend a lot of time looking for people any company that gives you an exploding offer is not particularly reasonable. You can also use one offer to go to another company that's being slow into moving a little bit faster, but you want to leave yourself room to maneuver. Okay. Once again, it was on the first slide. My email address is cquinn at die.net. I'm still involved on a part-time basis with Taos, a systems administration consultancy. If you want to go ahead and send me a copy of your resume, we can put you through one of our interviews. Use it as a practice interview. I've spoken about this with them at length. They love doing this. Every year, every time I give this talk, a few people go ahead and send me a resume, and it's a fun practice interview. Additionally, I'm also moving forward into uh, starting up a DevOps group, which the fact they're calling it a DevOps group is the first problem I intend to fix, but we'll get there. And again, it's worth having a conversation about interviews. Worst case, I am more than willing to sit down with someone and go soup to nuts on what it is, how you approach interviews and what we can do to help. Besides, best case, you get to work with someone who wears a suit. <laughs> now, I have one question for the room. Do you have any questions for me? <laughs> what have we got? Um, so what are some interview questions that you do like? You spoke a lot about interview questions that you hate. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Just on a technical perspective or a uh, more soft skills perspective? Uh, either one. On a technical side, I love open-ended questions. Uh, tell me what you've done with X. Or one of my personal favorite architectural questions is I want someone to design a system to do X. I don't know. Um, maybe it's uh, calculate restaurant orders. And maybe it's uh, do a tiny URL clone. Maybe it's a DNS service. And then have them whiteboard it out. And from there, OK, now we're going to turn this into a scaling question. Those, those topics are broad enough that you can go in almost any direction. We can talk about the code. We can talk about the network. We can talk about the hardware. We can talk about what happens when you're now in 10 data centers and one blows itself off the map randomly every half an hour. How do you handle sync replication issues? You can take those down into the very nitty gritty while also getting into the areas and start to sketch out 
uh, from the other side of the table what someone's good at versus what they aren't and how they might fit into this. Because there are very few people that can do everything required to set up something like that themselves. So do we need to get a DBA in? Do we need to get a network person in separately? Do we need to get someone who actually knows how to use a computer, et cetera? And it just lets people wind up figuring out where the, lim where, figure out where the limits are of that particular candidate. Cool. That's the one I tend to like. Yes. Let's talk about clothes. Sure. Um, what's appropriate when and how? I'm the only person I know who dresses down for interviews. I do not show up like this because people think I'm trying to sell them something. And I am, but I don't want to be obvious about it. Um, generally, I tend to wear jeans these days, dress shoes, a blazer, and lose the tie. That's my personal approach. I like to dress one step above what the person I'm meeting with usually does. At that level, you will almost never get it wrong. The exception is if you're doing East Coast investment bank interviews, everyone wears a suit. You can also, when you, usually you've spoken to someone in HR who has uh, mentioned, who has, you've, uh, who's guiding you through the process, there's no shame in asking if you're, un, if you're unsure about that. I've hit a point in my career where I uh, have the technical background and what I've done that I can just about walk in in something offensive and still get the job. I haven't tried this yet, but that's my next practice interview. <laughs> so I'll, I'll report back and let you know how that goes. But yeah, ultimately, uh, probably even the jeans, they have to be nice jeans. I would say if you want to swap those out for khakis, then you're spot on and no one can, no one can uh, find that objectionable. Well, these, these jeans are no holes or scuffs like that? Yep, I would consider that. Yeah, swap out the uh, shoes for dress shoes, maybe put a long sleeve button down. Short sleeve is not usually quite as uh, good to go with. Yeah. Um, so you said we could do a practice interview with you. Sure. Now, where would we meet you at? Like, how far away from here is it? I live in San Francisco, but we're also a distributed company on both sides. So most of these are done either through Skype or through phone. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> we're talking about a Seattle office at Originate. Yes. So I have health problems that can occasionally drastically affect my job performance. Yes. How do I can get the job? Mm -hmm. Yes, I would probably have those conversations once the offer letter has been uh, submitted before you accept it. Um, remember, there are things like ADA requires reasonable accommodation for medical challenges. Uh, the question is, what defines reasonable? Like, yeah, so I only like to do work about two hours a month. Is that going to be a reason? That's probably not reasonable. But I need to be able to have flex days to stay home on days I'm not doing particularly well and work remotely. That could very well be reasonable. It's, but the time to have that conversation is after they're already sold. You don't want to give a particular red flag before you've accepted, before that uh, offer has come through. You might also very privately have that discussion with HR after accepting the offer. But I'm my per and this is not uh, legal advice by any stretch of the imagination. It is, uh, I guess, more life advice. I would also, I, I personally want to make sure that the company is aware of it before it becomes a noticeable issue. Uh, I used to have a coworker who had uh, trouble sleeping. And so he would always be late going to bed and could never be on time in the morning. So I finally sat down and talked with him about this. It's, you're about to get fired. What's, what's the deal here? He said, well, I'm having some medical issues. Great. Go to HR today. Explain that. Tell them you are enrolling in a sleep study to figure out what's going on, which you are going to do. And he did this, and he wound up working there for another two years. It, but it's, you have to be proactive in that because they can't react and make accommodations for things they don't see. Of course. Uh, uh, one question quickly and the other question. Sure. Uh, one quickly, um, would a polo shirt work well with uh, casual dress? I, I used to work at Intel and that was like their uniform yep. was. I jeans. did a project up there, yeah. Yeah, jeans and polo shirt. Yep. And always a collared shirt. Would that work well with the interview? Or should I generally tend to dress up for interviews. People always expect it. Unless you show up in a full tux with wingtips, mm -hmm. you're usually going to be okay overdressing slightly for the interview. Yep. And people might tease you a bit, but in practice, I have never dinged yeah. someone for showing up overdressed. I have for showing up significantly underdressed. Okay. When you have an offensive t-shirt on and holes in your jeans and you smell, mm -hmm. that tells me a lot about how seriously you're taking this. Right. Yeah, your second question. Mm -hmm. Because of that, because she couldn't get the accommodations fast enough. So yes. 
So definitely at the point of getting um, getting the offer letter, if she gets an offer letter, that's when she should start to point out, I have se severe depression and I have issues moment, uh, with being motiva motivated. But she's a brilliant programmer. She just okay. works very hard. Uh, the question, sorry, I realize I should be repeating this for the uh, for the future recording. Right. The question is, is when you have, correct me if I'm misunderstanding this, if uh, severe depression is a challenge, how do you wind up disclosing that? Generally, I tend to give information, as, li as little information as possible. I'm currently having some uh, challenges uh, that are depression-oriented that I am working through medically. Uh, I would probably disclose that up front to the HR group. And then they are, HR is, the entire department is there for this express purpose purpose, more or less, to a point where they can figure out what a reasonable accommodation is, they can handle messaging to your manager and approach it from that perspective. And that would be at the point of the offer? Yes, at the, uh, at the earliest, if not a little bit later. You don't want them necessarily to rescind an offer based on that. Not that that's ethical, but companies do strange things sometimes. You want, the, you want some employment protections. Yes. Um, the question is how to break into the tech industry. I would start by bringing rope. No, um, the, the trick is, is to figure out what you're passionate about and what you, what you want to do. And I'm hoping that by getting into this industry, it's because you have a passion for it and not because, well, I heard there was money here. Uh, if that case, uh, save yourself some time and heartache and go be an investment banker somewhere. The, the trick is, is I find that talking to people who are interested in this stuff, I find open source uh, communities to be a fantastic way in. I spent over half a decade running the Freenode IRC network, and yes, we had a dress code. But it, that was a great way of meeting people who were movers and shakers in the larger community. It was also a good way to figure out what events were going on near me. I would go to meetup groups, and I would just start talking to people. Because ultimately, someone you know in your network is going to need a gopher who starts off as the cable and mouse person who's going to go to the various desktops and get things set up. Or someone who's going to have to do a horrible data entry project. The, the hardest job to get is your first one. Disregard everything else I said about salary negotiation, etc. Your first job will pay you far more than the money. They will give you the first legitimate entry on your resume to break into this stuff. And that, that turns into a bit of a separate talk. <laughs> yes? Um, as far as the um, what questions do you have for us part, mm -hmm. what if you don't have any? You already know the company culture because you've got a buddy who's on the inside. You uh, know what they need because you've discussed it with the yes. interviewer two or three times. Yes. What do you do then? Great question. The question was, is if you don't have any questions when uh, that gets to that part because you already know the company extremely well, um, I would wind up going a bit further. I would ask other questions. For example, can you take me through a typical day in my, uh, in my job? Can you give me something approximating what you want to see from me in the first 90 days that I'm there? And turn it into a much more action-oriented task. The idea there is you're not just trying to learn more yourself. You're trying to put the interviewer in a frame of mind where they're picturing you in the job. From there, the benefit that you unlock is that they started to think of you that way. That also means if you know the company that well, you also have a significant in. Yes. So um, I've been prepping for interviews a lot recently. And mm -hmm. One of the things we're kind of told is the two best places to take control of an interview yes. are at the end when you're given the opportunity to ask questions because you can prepare them in advance and you can really hit a home run there. Yes. Um, and then also at the beginning because it seems like typically the first question asked is tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes. How would you recommend responding, or what's, what are some tips you have for answering that? Question? Oh, the, the question is, how would I respond to the uh, beginning uh, question of, tell me about yourself? Great question. Uh, the I've learned not to ask that question in interviews because in some cases that means I've just given someone uh, carte blanche to babble for half an hour about things I don't care about. By the time you're naming, telling me the seventh or eighth cat that you have and what their name is, at that point we're mostly done. Um, what I like to do uh, at that point, tell if so I will always bring it right back to what we're talking about. Mention a brief, probably 15 second synopsis of your career and then talk about what you're working on lately that is ideally related to what they're doing. And then pass it back to them. Because ideally, if they're good, they'll find something interesting in what you're working on and take the direction, take the uh, conversation in the direction you want it to go. Yeah. Interviewing and uh, networking in cities that, look, that are not local. Yes. Um, 
Um, I start by identifying specific companies, not necessarily specific cities. Uh, if you, for example, if you want to talk to a company that is based in San Francisco, it's expensive to head down there just for an interviewing trip. So what you might do is reach out directly to companies. Uh, if you're considering working remote, make that clear. A lot of places talk about remote work. If you're open to relocation, uh, what you can often do as well is batch up uh, trips to a city where you're meeting with multiple companies in a short period of time. Turn it into an uh, interesting approach. But in the tech sector these days, once you've attained a sufficient level of seniority, uh, companies are more than willing to be flexible on things like that. The talent and the ability is harder to find than people who are that are willing to move to the city necessarily. So people are more than will or more willing than other parts of the cycle to entertain such things. I'm a big believer in having beers at random, yes. But uh, as far as doing it in a particular city, if you have the option to go do that, terrific. If you don't, then you're going to have to start finding more online-oriented communities and people talking about random things there. Most uh, uh, mailing lists are a good source for that. Uh, IRC channels, lugs are often good sources for this stuff. It depends on what you're looking for. Hopefully that's helpful. Uh, what would you uh, answer if somebody asked you how much you want to Oh, if someone asked me how much I want to earn. Oh, that's a great question. I have a default answer ready to go. $500,000 a year and a company helicopter. Because that's the number I have in my mind that I don't care if my job description is repainting lines in the parking lot or installing lightning arresters on the roof. It doesn't matter. You've bought me. For less than that, now we're having a discussion. For anything up to that point, at that point or above, congratulations. I will go wherever you want me to work. I don't care if it's Hoboken. We're doing it. Because for that much money, you have bought me. And when they say, that's, that's stupendous. I could buy an entire department for that. Yeah, you probably should. It's, yeah. The question is, if we're talking less than that, and make sure that number is sufficiently high that no one of sane mind would actually pay it. Pro tip. Otherwise, people say, okay, we can do that. What have you done? If you're not embarrassed to name the number, it's not high enough. <laughs> yes. I was raised in a culture where self-promotion and bragging is frowned upon. Mm -hmm. And right now, at the age of 30, I don't know how to. Right. So what's the limit? How can I practice so that I don't sound obnoxious when I... Yeah, you'll notice that sounding obnoxious is not a fear that I seem to have. I just pretty much <laughs> run with that. Yeah, the question is, when you're raised in a culture where self-promotion is frowned upon, how do you overcome that later in life? And that's a good question. It's not going to feel natural the first few times you do it. Um, I would suggest going to a variety of public speaking events. Toastmasters is a good place for this, where it becomes more about your center stage. You are the center of attention. You have to be entertaining, engaging, and talk about yourself. There, that's very closely tied to self-promotional as far as what you've done and what you're capable of. And it starts, in my experience, with public speaking. So hopefully that's helpful. Yes? So someone's on the other side of the interview table, mm -hmm. um, and they ask you what your prior uh, compensation was. Yep. Is there any reason to tell the truth? Uh, when, when I'm a candidate or when I'm, because the reason I, oh, when I'm trying to hire you, the reason I'd like to know that is because that helps me figure out pretty easily what I can wind up uh, bringing you in at. Let's talk about round numbers for a second and why it's such a bad idea to name a number first. Um, let's say that I have a job that I'm trying to fill and I can pay, let's say, a max of $60,000 a year for this. Now, let's say that you're making 50 grand and you and I ask you for a number and you tell me what it is you will what it is you want. If you say 75, then I'm going to cross you off the list because you're too expensive. If you say 50 grand, well shit, I just saved 10 grand. Awesome. Welcome aboard. And if you say 60, let's say you get it exactly right on the nose, then okay, terrific, but you're always going to wonder, what if you had asked for 65? The, the best you can do is break even. There's no win for you in that scenario. It's all downhill. Um, and the reason that a lot of companies want to know early on is, let's say you are that guy that wants 75. I want to know now at the beginning so I can not call you back ever again. What you want to do is if you do want 75, is uh, you want to have met me a couple of times. I am totally sold on you. I've already gone to HR and said, yes, get it. 
and then you come back and you're a little more expensive than we thought. Look, we budgeted 60 for this position. Can we meet at 68? Congratulations, you just made $8,000 appear from nowhere. That's why you wait. Hopefully that makes sense. Further questions? Yes? I'm actually interested in writing documentation. Good. Uh, does your um, mock interview offer include people with documentation skills? Absolutely. In fact, uh, one thing, uh, as a consultant, I find writing documentation is uh, critical. One of my side projects that they're bringing me in for, for example, is to write a book in my spare time, which is going to be fascinating. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, watch this space. We'll see what actually winds up happening. I a book on this. <laughs> you know, I've considered writing it. It seems like it's an interesting idea. Your hand was up earlier. Do you have anything um, I can answer for you? Here, here's a, this, this is pro, pro specific, specific to me. I, I was working at uh, XYZ yep. uh, two years ago. I was let, up, let, I was let go. Mm hmm and I've been talking again with uh, my former boss. Yes. And he says, yeah, let's talk. How do I get, how do I get in again and get in again at more money than I made before? Mm -hmm. Well, simply put, uh, inflation alone would dictate that every dollar you made back then is worth about 95 cents today. So that's in part of it. In, oh, yeah. Inflation generally tends to average out. Uh, this past year was a little weird, but around, right around 3% a year. So if you get a cost of living raise that's less than that, congratulations. You've effectively uh, got made less money this year than you did the one last, than you did last in terms of buying power. That turns into a whole broader economic conversation. But it's expected that people cost more money. I'm also going to assume that you didn't wind up uh, spending the last two years sitting around twiddling your thumbs waiting for them to call you back. There's presumably, you've presumably learned new skills, even if you haven't been working, where you are now more capable of an employee than you were two years ago. Be sure to highlight that. So good question. Thank you. Yes? Who do you think are the most important software that as an interviewee, the most important soft skills uh, depends entirely on what I'm doing. They all tend to distill down to don't be a jerk, but what that uh, looks like past that is someone who can be collaborative, someone who is able to work in many cases with difficult people. Depending on the company, maybe there are strong personalities and someone who's able to argue passionately and persuasively. It's going to depend greatly upon the role, but People want to work generally with people who make them feel good. If they're in an interview and every conversation they have is stilted and awkward and they have to repeat themselves six times, that shows that maybe communication difficulties are going to be important. Um, an example I gave up being authoritatively wrong is another one. If you're right 90% of the time and hilariously wrong the remaining 10%, I, there's a good chance I have to check every piece of work you submit just because I don't know where that 10% of just making it up goes. Whereas when someone who explicitly calls out, this is the limit of my knowledge and here's where I would go to find that answer, that's useful. Someone who, uh, the most valuable answer I ever get in an interview is when someone says, I don't know. And if the answer is never, then either I need to add dig deeper until we hit a limit of knowledge or there's something seriously wrong. More questions, yes. Oh boy, a two-part question. What do we got? Okay, so in interviews, sometimes I'll get a question like, um, why should we hire you? Yes. The first question is, how do you feel about that question? And the second question, is this a good time to say, I'm awesome? Great. Okay, the question is two parts. The first is, when, how do I feel about the question of why should we hire you? And two is, I'm awesome, a valid answer. Uh, I love the question, personally. The reason being is it's a bit of an on-the-spot question but it's being very direct and upfront about a question they're asking you anyway. And as far as, be, well, is I'm awesome a good response to that? It's good for a throwaway laugh, but it's not going to go uh, too much deeper than that. Because they want, you have, if you use it, you have to immediately follow up with. But on a more serious note, you're trying to achieve X, Y, and Z. And I've done all of those things at this previous company. Here's how that unfolded. That's what they're looking for, as opposed to, well, I'm here because I wound up seeing a job in a newspaper, which I was reading for some inexplicable reason, and it beat th this beat uh, going and uh, petting my dog for another hour. So you they just want to have an answer that shows passion and confidence to some extent. It's a bit of an odd question to hear because it sort of violates the social norm a bit, but I'm okay with that. 
Yes. So do you have any tips for someone who has a lot of experience working in one particular industry? Not yes. In the tech industry, but there are many different areas of tech industry. And yes. And they're trying to make a big change. Great question. Uh, so if I can restate that a bit, just to make sure we're talking about the same thing, uh, it's if you have a lot of experience in one particular industry, how do you go about changing industries? Yes, I do. Um, they say the average person graduating from school today will have upwards of 15 careers by the time that they retire. That does that is not to say that someone goes and does something for a while and then starts over and back at ground zero. They find a way to parlay what they have done into something else. So if you're let's let's pick an industry. Uh, let's say aerospace, for example. You have a lot of experience there. You don't want to do aerospace anymore. Let's say you want to do something else. Well, okay, there are a lot of commonalities between aerospace and uh, these days automotive design. So being able to go talk to a company that's involved in, in the car space might be a very good next step as far as transitioning. Because what you want to do is show that all of the work you have done in your career to this point is directly applicable to something else. Otherwise, you're starting off as someone back at square one, way down the pay scale. This needs to be a parallel move. And I don't know enough about either one of those industries to say whether that's reasonable in one step, but it's definitely reasonable in two or three where you wind up going from what you're doing in aerospace over to something that's a bit more oriented around the elements that appeal to car manufacturers. So it, it takes a multi-step transition, but every one of those should be a lateral move. You should not be falling way back down the ladder just because you want to go work in a different industry. Hopefully that helps. Yes? Um, if you are applying for a job that has nothing to do with your past experience, yes. if you're Mm -hmm. Would you include that on your resume, or would you ditch it? Um, the question is, is if my previous experience had nothing to do with what I want to be doing and the jobs I'm applying for, would I include it, or would I ditch it? I would include it, and I would go move heaven and earth to call out the things that are relevant to what they would be doing. Frankly, I don't care if your previous experience was serving people at McDonald's. You have customer service experience. You can turn parts of that into project management-oriented expertise. Uh, if you're working with Fry later, that is modern technology. You can find a way to work that in. It, really, I mean, I'm being slightly facetious here, but not by much. There are, there are very few job, jobs you can hold up that has absolutely zero, zero in common. Everyone, everyone works with people. Everyone, everyone, everyone is all resolves with different personalities. Everyone resolves conflict to some extent. I would focus, I would focus strongly, strongly on that. Yes. 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 Y
There's something that uh, you need to have a story about what you were doing. But I sat on the couch and did nothing is not compelling. Neither is I spent three years looking for work. So there needs to, because that starts to say, well, why couldn't this person in a booming sector find work for that period of time? But a few months is absolutely nothing to uh, be concerned about. Personally, I'll sometimes even have catch up. I'll do a bunch of small um, freelance projects on the side on a steady and ongoing basis. So on my resume, yeah, I had one full-time job. There were a couple months gap and another full-time job. But I've also been doing consulting uh, for various clients spread over a seven-year span. So that sometimes can be used to fill in gaps too, just different strategies. Yes? Mm -hmm. Good point. Uh, you're being very sensitive about people you're likely never to see again. But on a, on a more serious note, you're right. You never know where people are going to where to wind up. So in the middle of your interview, if you don't get along with them, uh, saying "knock knock," who's there? Not me anymore. See ya. Doesn't really tend to work very well. Um, I will generally humor them until the end of the interview and then not accept the job or come in with more money than I know they're willing to pay because you were too expensive to work there is not, an in, not a terrible way to go. Um, but if they want to pay you that. Eh, that's the downside. <laughs> you can always turn down a job. Just make sure you do it politely because you don't want to burn a bridge. You never know when the jerk you're talking to today is somewhere you really want to work, and you're not going to work directly with them, not with them in that new role, but they are a gatekeeper. People are very mobile in this industry. I generally try to avoid irritating people as much as possible. Obviously, I suck at it, but it's a nice ideal to strive for. Yes? How do you handle the, like, you don't have a degree question? Um, on paper, I have an eighth grade education, so I handle that really well. Um, I don't have an education section on my resume. I don't have, I don't allude to it at all. I actually dropped out of college. That's a different story. But I, it, it, that's not interesting to me. What you need, what a degree is, is ultimately a piece of paper that says you know things. Uh, that pay piece of paper can also be a resume. It can also be something that you're recognized as, a, as an expert for. Personally, I use it as a filtering mechanism. I've worked way too many places that only hired degreed employees who were terrible. I don't find that to be a useful metric. And companies that get really hung up on where you went to school and what you studied, for me, have self-selected out from being a place I would work. Tech is not exactly a small niche industry. So there are a lot of places that really don't care. Sure. Sure. Remember, it's a two-way street. A lot of these places are terrible. Uh, I've worked with way too many degreed morons to really have a whole lot of faith in that, oh, a degree means they're an awesome coworker. There were a few more. For, yes. So if uh, a company turns you down after you interview with them, yep. I heard that often they don't give you pretty much a good idea of what they didn't like. Mm -hmm. Is there a way for you to know what part of that? Not usually. Uh, the question is, is when a company turns you down, can you find out why? Uh, depends. If you have a personal relationship with someone there, you might be able to find out through a back door. But most companies are scared to death of getting sued. And most people won't sue for that, but the one in a hundred that does ruins it for the rest. So it's a, we decided to go a different direction, is safe, is non-offensive, non and you don't, and people are terrified of giving a protected reason that winds up blowing holes in things. Yes. And uh, first tech interview, what sort of good self-promotion, things to be self-promotional about? Uh, assuming you don't have a technical resume or technical achievements in your background, talk about being a self-starter. Talk about how quickly you learn new things. Talk about how you have a deep an abiding passion for the area, but you haven't had a chance to demonstrate it yet, and you're really, really looking forward to being active in this space. Everything's positive, everything's upbeat, and there are no problems, there are only challenges. Yeah. Yes? On the subject of uh, why you didn't get the interview, mm -hmm. why you didn't get the offer. Yes. I've asked uh, several times, could I get some constructive constructive criticism on mm -hmm. why? Yeah. And more often than not, I get it. Yep. It depends entirely on who you're speaking with. But yes, some companies will do it, some won't. But asking for feedback never hurts. And it shows you're at least self-aware. Just don't necessarily take what they say as gospel. Because it's it could just be they didn't get along. 
couple more questions, and I think we're being shooed out of the room. Yes. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on guidelines on thank you emails? Uh, on thank you emails. They certainly don't hurt, but they can be time intensive. Uh, that said, if you genuinely like them and you really want to uh, follow up, I would suggest doing that uh, after a few days to help remind them that you exist to prod them along. I tend to get uh, a double bang for my buck that way. That said, it's usually um, a nice idea, but it's not a requirement by any stretch of the imagination. One more question? Anyone? There we are. Suppose you've only got a pile of education and yep. no actual experience in the tech industry. Mm -hmm. Okay, what do you do if you have a pile of education and no actual experience in the tech industry? Um, hopefully that education was in something more useful than underwater basket weaving that you can point at and say, uh, here's where my theoretical knowledge lies, here's how it maps exactly to what your company is doing, and, uh, and go from there. Uh, realize asking me that question is probably, I'm the, probably the least authoritative person in the world to intelligently answer that, but it doesn't hurt. Uh, the one thing I would suggest against is implying that the education itself serves as a reason why, well, if I can get insert pile of PhDs here, then how hard could what you people do be? That attitude tends to come across and really rub some people the wrong way. Uh, I worked in education for a year as the network administrator where I was servicing PhDs, and that, that attitude was palpable and very off-putting. It's a, I am inherently better than you are because I am considered a world-renowned scholar in this particular field that has nothing to do with the question I'm asking you. That tends to go the wrong direction. My humor tends to be very self-deprecating. You want to, ideally in interview scenarios, go for that joke. You don't want to be using humor that offends people. Sometimes I hit it, sometimes I don't. Thank you very much for listening to me, Babber.